a wonderful person, this is Anton, and right behind me you see planet Venus, the closest planet to us. The planet that mystified the scientists for several decades, and the planet that we still know so little about. And in the past few years I've explored this planet for various reasons, but it's really in the last two years that we actually started to explore this planet as a potential source of possible bacterial life living somewhere where we don't really expect it. Specifically living in the Venusian atmosphere in the region somewhere above 50 km mark. And that's actually where in theory there are conditions that could be somewhat similar to planet Earth. Okay, similar in some ways, but not in all ways. The pressure here would be very similar, the temperature would be kind of similar as well, but the conditions would still be quite extreme. First of all, it's really high up in the air, and second of all, it's really acidic. But here on Earth we do have various extremophiles that would probably be able to survive here as well. And so a couple of years ago, back in September of 2020, there was a somewhat controversial paper that claimed to have discovered signs of the molecule known as phosphine in the upper atmosphere of Venus. And this was important for one reason. Phosphine is generally produced in only two ways, either through extreme volcanism or by certain types of bacteria that release phosphine as a byproduct, at least in large enough amounts to be detected from planet Earth. And this of course created a huge buzz in the scientific community. Since there were no visible signs of volcanism in the last few millions of years on the surface of Venus, the only other explanation was that maybe it was life. Extreme life, but life nevertheless. And this was of course not the first time life was proposed on this beautiful planet. As a matter of fact, even back in the days, Carl Sagan wrote this paper, and this was from 1967, proposing how life could easily survive in Venusian conditions, and actually implying that several observations from Venus could be because of life. Which observations, you may ask? Or at least, I guess I asked when I heard about this. And well, the observations are kind of unique. First of all, when looking at the atmosphere of Venus, for many years the scientists have been discovering these unusual patches as if something is absorbing UV light in the upper atmosphere of Venus. Today they are known as the UV absorbers, and there have been several explanations suggesting that this could be caused by some kind of a microorganism. As a matter of fact, Carl Sagan in his paper explains exactly how these organisms could actually use UV light to survive and to thrive in these conditions. Even more of these absorbers were discovered back in 2019, suggesting that there is definitely something unusual going on here. Although, as a counter-argument, there was a paper from just a couple of years ago that has also tried to explain these UV absorbers by showing that certain types of red oil, or basically various organic compounds concentrated in sulfuric acid, can actually produce extremely similar observations. And so in that sense, maybe there are alternative explanations. But in the last few years there were also several discoveries and several papers, and you can actually find some of them in the description below, that presented a really strong argument for why life could easily exist in the upper atmosphere of Venus, and how in theory it actually has everything it needs to survive here, or not just survive, but to thrive and reproduce, without any additional needs. But more importantly, in just the last few years, Various NASA missions have also started to discover quite a lot of unexpected life right here on planet Earth in the upper atmosphere of Earth. Some of the airplane-based missions that NASA conducted discovered billions of organisms in every location on the planet, with various types of organisms traveling through the clouds and actually forming active ecosystems high above the surface of the planet, with approximately 5000 cells per cubic meter with this right here being one of the first discoveries, but so many more have been made in the last few years. And though they've actually discovered approximately 300 different families of bacteria, it seems that 17 bacteria were present in every single sample. Intriguingly, these studies have also suggested that various very powerful weather effects, such as for example hurricanes or various storms, serve as a kind of an atmospheric escalator or as a kind of a mixer that tends to pick up microbes from planet Earth and distributes them across the entire planet. But also, some of them stay in the atmosphere, never leaving, and actually thrive in there as well. With some of the microbes discovered, using oxalic acid that's present in the atmosphere as the major source of food. And so since it's been found here on Earth, and since they do thrive in the atmosphere of our own planet, why not Venus? And actually, why not a lot of other planets? But right now we're just going to be talking about Venus. Well, at the moment, the actual discovery of phosphine is still a bit controversial. During the original presentation, the scientists claimed to have discovered approximately 20 parts per billion of phosphine molecules, which would imply that something was actively producing phosphine and it could not be explained in any other way. This was using some of the preliminary data from ALMA telescope, which initially created a bit of a problem. Turns out that there was a bit of a bias in the data, 
and there was a bit of an error, including a potential data analysis error in the paper itself. Reanalysis discovered something different. Now, some papers actually claimed that there was no phosphine, but most of the reanalysis established that there was phosphine, just in much smaller amounts. Instead of being 20 parts per billion, it was now at approximately 1 parts per billion. So much lower than initial estimates, but still there for some reason. With several other papers discovering values anywhere from 7 to 20 times lower than the original prediction. But on top of this, and this is really unexpected, some of the analysis from the Pioneer Venus multiprobe from 1978 has actually also discovered phosphine in some of the early data. And another telescope, JCMT that you see right here, discovered it as well. In other words, the phosphine was still being found by various papers, just in much smaller amounts than previously seen. Now, it's obviously still possible that we're actually seeing something else, for example, a mixture of hydrogen sulfide and maybe some chlorine that can maybe produce something similar. But nevertheless, the intrigue was already there, and so the scientists became really interested in discovering what exactly is causing these observations. Some other studies have even found some other interesting molecules, such as carbonyl sulfides, which are usually very difficult to produce inorganically, and just like phosphine, are usually produced by volcanoes or by certain types of life. And so the question was still, was there phosphine or was it something else? And if it was phosphine, what was producing it? So that last question, what's producing it, we're not going to have an answer for until later on, when NASA finally launches several missions we discussed in one of the previous videos in the description. These missions are planned for the next few years, and they hopefully are going to provide a little bit more clarity on what's actually happening. But we finally have the most accurate and the most direct observations of the atmosphere of this beautiful planet that definitively tell us if there is or isn't phosphine. And this is from the paper that was just released a few days ago. And to get this data, the scientists really had to work hard. They used SOFIA, the now-retired flying telescope that usually was able to provide some of the most accurate observations by going above the atmosphere and by looking at objects, ignoring atmospheric disturbances, while also being able to track the objects and reposition itself as needed. In this case, though, Venus can only be seen during certain times of the day, right before sunrise. It's why it's known as the morning star. And that means that you have to be really careful not to stare at the sun as it's basically coming up. And so here the pilots had to conduct extremely accurate flight maneuvers in order to observe the Venusian atmosphere and to collect as much accurate data as possible. And they would also only have approximately half an hour per day and would have to be in a very specific location for all of this to be possible. And so following these very accurate observations, the data revealed that there is a little bit of phosphine, approximately 0.7 parts per billion. Definitely much lower than the initial observations, but still sort of maybe there. And for some reason, it appears to be a little bit more abundant right before the morning on Venus starts. So basically during nighttime, or I guess right before dawn. And so in other words, these very accurate observations seem to still find just a little bit of phosphine in the Venusian atmosphere. Now it's about 30 times less than the original detection, and also seems to be at higher altitudes, up to about 75 to 110 kilometers, but it also seems to vary with time. In other words, whatever is happening here is definitely mysterious and needs to be investigated. But here's the thing, as I mentioned before, it can still be produced by volcanoes. And as you might have learned from one of the previous videos, there's actually an important indication from the last few years that maybe Venus is still volcanically active, even today. And so for all we know, maybe the actual detection here is not of potential life, but of potential volcanoes that we're not seeing. Either way, at the moment, nobody knows. It's interesting, it's intriguing, and it's definitely thought-provoking, and it might be our first time discovering life outside of planet Earth ever, but at the same time, it might lead to some other discoveries that at least in theory could be just as exciting. We don't really know where it leads just yet, but the missions planned for the next few years will definitely help us uncover the mystery of the beautiful planet. Until then, thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, and maybe support the channel on Patreon by joining channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye bye.